What's up, everybody? How you doing? Oh, man, you guys came ready to go. You came ready to go. I've got good news for you. Next weekend, we get to kick off our Christmas Eve services here at CCV. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? So here's what we thought. We thought, why not jumpstart the Christmas season and just sing a bunch of Christmas songs tonight with our family? How about that? So why don't you stand up? Let's sing some Christmas songs together. Come on.
singing o'er the plains and the mountains in reply echoing their joyous strains Gloria come
Yeah, I want to thank you for joining in and singing your welcome to take your seats. You know, it is so good to be in this Christmas season, isn't it? Gather together, sing the songs like we just sang, and being reminded of God's goodness. And I can't think of any other time of the year that just points to God's plan for us more than this season. And that plan is that we would have a life that's free from guilt and shame. We'd have forgiveness. And we would live in joy and peace. And it's all made possible for us because God sent his one and only son. And that's what we celebrate. That's what we remember. But I also recognize that many of us, myself included, there's times that we kind of struggle a little bit with feeling maybe unworthy to receive what God has for us. We just feel a little unworthy. And, and oftentimes we justify it because let's be honest, we know ourselves better than anybody else knows us. We know the stuff that we struggle with, the sin in our lives, but I wanna remind you and encourage you that God doesn't look at us that way when we're following Jesus. You see, when we believe in Jesus, when we invite him into our lives, when we embrace the forgiveness that he has for us, he sees us, he looks at us through the lens of his perfect son. I'm telling you, that's incredible. See, God always had a plan for us, and it's through Jesus that we would live in Jesus, that we would experience the Father's love through his Son. And we would have a life that's living in freedom rather than condemnation. You know, the Bible talks about it. It's in the book of Romans, chapter 8, at the very beginning. It says, there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And it goes on, and it says, because you belong to him, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you have victory over sin. And I'm telling you, that is such good news. And as we go into this time of communion, where we remember Christ's sacrifice, let's take some time to not only thank him for what he's done, but wrap our minds around the freedom and the peace and the joy that we experience in him. And I wanna pray for us uh, as we get ready to do that. God, we come before you in this space and we're so thankful. We're so thankful for Jesus and his sacrifice. We're grateful for the peace that we have, the joy that we experience. And I pray that you'd help all of us embrace the love that you have for us, recognize the goodness that you give us every single day. And we do that in the name of Jesus, amen.
Well, I want to welcome everybody here today. It's great to have you here. And if you are new with us, uh, we're honored that you're here. We hope that your experience is, is one that you enjoy and that you find that CCV is a place where you belong. It's great to have you. And as many of you know, we are stepping into Christmas at CCV. We have services starting next Saturday, December 18th, running all the way through December 24th, Christmas Eve. And you can find the information on those service times on your app online. We also have the cards available for you, the invite cards. It has a QR code on the back. You can scan it. It'll take you up to any campus in all the service times that we have throughout the valley. Here's what I would really encourage all of us to do. To not only bring our families with us, because it's a family-friendly event outside, under the stars, Man, there's going to be coffee, hot chocolate available, great music. But I'd also encourage you to bring somebody with you. And I think when I say it, you probably can picture that person you work with, maybe the neighbor across the street or next to you. Let's really do a great job of allowing other people to come with us and experience the hope and the joy that we have in Jesus. So let's do that. We're very excited about that. Hey, the other thing that has been going on around here is in November on the 20th, we had our CCV for the Valley Serve Day. And I know many of you were a part of that. I just am so excited to let you know we had 293 CCV groups participate in that. Check this out. 6,815 of you, of people who go to CCV, joined those groups. We can put our hands together. Here's what is worth celebrating. It was an opportunity for us to do exactly what we were saying. Hey, as a church, as followers of Jesus, we are for the valley. So we're gonna do more than just say it. We're gonna get out there and do something. It was incredible. In fact, I'd like you to take just about a minute here and look at some highlights from Serve Day. What a, what a great For the Valley Serve Day. I just love that video. You, you just saw a fraction of what was taking place all throughout the valley. Food drives, Thanksgiving meals, serving in schools and police departments and fire stations, helping the homeless and encouraging veterans. There were so many things. And to think that nearly 7,000 people from CCV just dove into some project with their group. And, and those are just the people that, that we're aware of that were doing that. But what a great picture of, of the church and the body of Christ being his hands and his feet. And serving shows that you are for the valley. And we talk a lot about how churches are often known by what they are against. But here at CCV, we want to be known for, for what it is that we are for. And CCV is is for serving our community and, and loving our neighbors and giving our resources and sharing our faith. And uh, next weekend, you just heard about the CCV Christmas services and we're calling it an event for everyone and it is a, a great chance for you to invite people. You know, last year we had around uh, 40,000 people and that was in, in COVID and two years ago we had 65,000 people that came that gives you some idea of, of the potential that is there. And when I say those numbers, just, just know we, we count people because people count. 
And we want you to know that there is value in those people. In other words, there were tens of thousands of people who heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and, and heard why it is that God left heaven and, and came to earth in, in the form of Jesus. So this is an, an easy invite for you that we need to take advantage of because this is a time when people are spiritually open to invitations. And so with that in, in mind, I want this message to inspire and to motivate you to openly share your faith. And I wanna make certain that you, you understand why it is that we make a big deal about praying for others or, or having spiritual conversations or extending invitations. It's because taking a risk and getting out of our comfort zone pales in comparison to the potential of people having their eternal address switched over to heaven. And throughout scripture, we, we are commanded to share the faith that we have with others. And even on that very first day of Jesus' life in the Christmas story, the shepherds waste no time in getting the word out. In Luke chapter two, verses 17 and 18, when they had seen him, this is the shepherds, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Because after you have an encounter with Jesus Christ, the natural response is to spread the word. And if you have had an encounter with Jesus Christ, and if he is real in, in your life, then the natural response is that you will want to spread the word as well. And what a great time of year to do so. You know, C.S. Lewis once said, sometimes rather than Sometimes rather than hearing new ideas, we need to be reminded of old truths. And so today what I wanna do is I just wanna give you three reminders. And these are things that you already know, but it never hurts for us to be reminded of them. Here's reminder number one. Jesus Christ came for the world. That's why he came. He, he came for everyone. Uh, Luke chapter two, verse 10. You know this from when you were in a Christmas program as a kid. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He's the Lord. So Jesus wasn't an exclusive gift. There were no strings attached to the gift of Jesus. He, he came for the world. That's why he came. He came so that everyone had grace and forgiveness and salvation available to them. All you had to do was put, put your trust in him. John 3, uh, 16, the first phrase of John 3, 16 simply says, for God so loved the world. And Jesus the Son is just like God the Father. And Jesus has a passion for every single person and his church is to have that same passion as well. Do you realize that back in the Roman Empire, there was only one organization that welcomed the rich and the poor, both uh, slaves and free, both Greek and Jew, both male and female. The only group to do that was the all-inclusive Church of Jesus Christ. And nothing like that had ever happened before where all of these different entities could be welcomed in. And today there's a tendency to be selective for us to, to kind of pick and choose who it is that we'll, we'll love. And if someone's convictions or morals or political beliefs or religious affiliation or sexual orientation is different than ours, then we tend to be less concerned about what happens to them. But God's word teaches us that we are to love everyone. And on that first Christmas, Jesus Christ came for all and it ended up costing him an awful lot. Years ago, I combined an anniversary gift and a Christmas gift for my wife, Beth. I don't know if you guys ever do this, where something's bigger than what you normally spend for one of those. And so, you know, Beth said to me, hey, let's just combine these two, because I really have had my eye on this cabinet for a long time. And so I said, well, I think we can do that. And she is very frugal, and so she's always looking for a good deal. And she said, you know what? They'll deliver it for $50, but if you borrow our neighbor John's truck, then we won't have to pay the $50. So I said, okay. So I, I asked John if we could borrow his truck. He said, yes. We went and got the cabinet. We got it moved in. Everything was fine. 
I'm getting ready to take his truck back over to his, his house, to his garage, and Beth looks at me and she says, are you sure that you're gonna be able to back that big truck in, into that garage? It's got some really big mirrors on the side. Are you sure you can get it in there? I'm like, huh, you gotta be kidding me. I'm a man, I can do this, right? <laughs> it's an innate skill that God has blessed us with. So I said, I, I've got it, babe. Don't, don't worry, I appreciate your concern. Well, I started backing that truck back in, and let me tell you, there was about one inch on one side and one inch to spare on the other side, so I'm trying to be so careful. Finally, I get it all the way back in. You will be relieved to know I did not scratch the mirrors. But I did come in at an angle. And so I, I backed John's truck into his wife's car. Yeah, that's how I felt about it, too. Uh, well, I, I went and rang the doorbell, because I certainly didn't want to go to my wife's house. Uh, <laughs> I went and rang their doorbell, and they weren't at home. And my son said, well, Dad, they're down at the Bennett's uh, Christmas party uh, down the street for the, for the neighbors. I said, okay. I said, well, they've got a landline, so I'll just call down there. So I called, and... Uh, Chelsea, one of the daughters, answers the phone, and I say, hey, Chelsea, how are you? Oh, it's as loud as can be. Everybody's laughing, having a good time. And I said, hey, would you get John on the phone for me? And I said, just as you hand him the phone, would you just say, love your neighbor as yourself? <laughs> I, I mean, it never hurts, right? So sure enough, I hear her saying, love your neighbor as yourself, and I hear John start laughing. Well, that made me feel a little bit better. So John picks up the phone, he says, hey, Dave, he said, hey, did you wreck my truck? <laughs> I said, well, uh, that's partially true. I, I, I wrecked your truck into your wife's new Lexus. <laughs> and uh, he, he was very nice about it, and his attorneys were great to work with. Uh, <laughs> But the real pain surfaced when all of the neighbors at the party began leaving me voicemails. And so I would get a voicemail later that night. This is Billy's driving school. We have an opening for you. And they did it all week long. So the next day, oh, this is AAA. We'd like to revoke your membership. You know, it went on and on every day, a different neighbor, a different person. And I could have paid 50 bucks to Home Depot had that cabinet delivered, but instead I ended up paying hundreds of dollars to do it myself because that's how doers get more done. <clears throat> but do you know what bothered me more than the price tag of fixing those two vehicles? What bothered me the most was that I didn't get invited to the Christmas party with the neighbors. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're all having a blast. And their excuse was, oh, well, um, we just knew that you were so busy as a pastor in the month of December. We thought you probably would have something going. Well, here's my point. Give me a chance, you know? At least invite me. It's nice to be invited. And then if I say no, it's, it, it's because it's my choice. But I just want to be invited. And it's the same with you. And it's the same with your friends. We want to be included the invitation communicates value. It, it says that someone wants to be in a closer relationship with me. And that's why God left heaven and he came to earth and he invites you to be a part of his family. And he wants you to spread the word, to invite others into a relationship with God. And when you invite someone to a CCV service, they may choose to say no. But I promise you it communicates something just to be invited, and you have planted a seed. And to that individual, it says, I I've been remembered, I've been valued, somebody cares about me. And that's exactly how Jesus Christ feels about everyone. And we want people to know that encouraging truth. But you know where it starts? It starts with you having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You have that relationship with Christ. That's the, the starting point. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16 says, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. For if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So your first responsibility is to make certain you're saved. Make certain that you have that relationship with Jesus Christ. Because it is difficult 
to lead someone to a place where you have never been. A lot of you all have, have asked as you've, you've come into church, since I'm from Kentucky, you've asked how, how things are going back there with these tornadoes Friday night. And uh, I've been on the phone a lot and I've had a lot of text messages back and forth, but uh, there were five states that were hit by these tornadoes Friday. Kentucky was hit the hardest. If you can imagine this, uh, a, a tornado being on the ground for over 200 miles. And that's what happened in Kentucky. It just was solid for 200 miles. And if you've seen the, the path of destruction that it brought, and it was incredible. And um, we had one touchdown 15 minutes from our house. It didn't, didn't do anything, cause any damage, but uh, they were all around. And uh, our hearts go out to the people in Mayfield, Kentucky, a couple hours away from where we live. But as I, I listened to stories yesterday, the one that really grabbed me was of a man who was in an apartment complex, and of course it had substantial damage and was just basically flattened, this apartment complex with all these people living in there. And um, one man crawled his way out of the rubble and then he walked to a police precinct. I don't know how far he had to walk to try to find even where he was and, and to make it to a police precinct. And when he got there, he said to them, there are a lot of people back in that apartment complex and a wall has fallen over the top and they can't get out, but I know where they are. And so he led them back and they made some moving of some different things and 30 people from the apartment complex walked out. And they got on a school bus and they, they, they drove to safety. Never could have happened if he hadn't been there before. And he led them to where he'd been. And that's what we want in your relationship with Jesus Christ. We want you to lead people to where you have been. That encounter that you had with Jesus Christ the transforming power of the gospel. So openly invite and boldly share. Jesus Christ came for the world, but the second reminder, you know this, Jesus Christ is for the valley. We say that a lot around here. There's another passage in the Bible that, that you probably know. It's Matthew chapter one, verses 20 and, and 21. It's part of the Christmas story. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So an angel is, is telling this to, to Joseph. And fortunately for Mary and Joseph, they didn't have the typical argument over what name to give to the baby. That's something that most young couples agonize over. You know, she likes this name. He says, oh, I had a bad experience with a guy like that. No, I can't do that. Well, she, he likes this name. Oh, no, I'm not going to do that one. And they go back and forth, right? Well, they didn't have to worry about that. Well, names are important. We named our son after his grandfather to honor my dad, but also to inspire my son. And names are important to both the parents and the child. And sometimes I think the parents just forget about that. Now, I went to school with a, a girl named Holly Wood. <laughs> what were they thinking, right? I went to college with a girl named Sandy Beach. Okay? I, I had a guy that I worked with. His name was Mike Clear. Mike Clear fell in love with a girl named Crystal. <clears throat> My student minister when I was in high school, his name was Kevin Oder. Now, he can't help it. I mean, that's a, that's a rough last name, right? Kevin Oder, I'm sure people gave him a hard time about that. I understand that one. I do not understand Kevin's father's name. You know what Kevin's father's name was? Ivan. Think about that for a second. Every time he introduces himself, I have an odor. <laughs> what? I have an odor. Well, I appreciate your honesty, you know? <laughs> I don't know what you say in a case like that, right? Uh, several years ago, I was doing a, a baby dedication with a, a number of families in church, and before the service, I was in the back going over each name, trying to make certain of the pronunciation of them, and there was a child being dedicated on, on the sheet. It said, Henry Bockweg the Ninth. 
And I thought, oh, that's got to be a typo, right? Henry Bachweg the ninth. So I said to Taylor, his mom, I said, hey, is that right or is that typed wrong? She said, oh, no, it's correct. She said, pray for me. I'm married to Henry the eighth. <laughs> you talk about a lot of pressure in that family. <laughs> what are you going to name our grandson? Hmm? <laughs> Naming a child is extremely important and would have been more so for Joseph and Mary because their son was God's son. Now, fortunately for them, God had already picked out the baby's name. Why? Because it would fulfill ancient prophecies about the Messiah. Do you know what the name Jesus means? Jesus means the one who saves. I love that. The one who saves. Joseph was instructed by an angel to name the child Jesus because in the years to come, that would reveal who he is and what he does, Jesus. And if you say that you are for the valley and you want to reach the valley, then you'll need to tell people the name of the one who can save the valley. And that's the name of Jesus. Acts chapter four, verse 12 says, salvation is found in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Everything comes back to that. For Thanksgiving, Beth and I went to Houston to be with our, our daughter, Sadie, and her family. And the day before Thanksgiving, uh, we were all at the home there, and there was a, a knock at the door, and it was, uh, it turned out it was a neighbor. And I went to the door, and my son-in-law came to the door, and she looked kind of familiar to uh, my son-in-law, but she had three cupcakes, so hey, come on in, right? And uh, Sadie came out, and, and we got to meet this neighbor. She was about 50 years old, and um, she had these cupcakes to give to my two-year-old granddaughter and to Sadie and to Aaron, and we all made small talk there, and my wife and I got to meet her, and it got to that point after a few minutes of small talk where we thought she was getting ready to leave, and then all of a sudden, she began to cry. And she walks across the living room, and she gives my daughter, Sadie, a hug. And she says, this Thanksgiving, I just wanted you to know how grateful I am for you. Thank you so much for reaching out to me. And Sadie said, well, we've, we've been praying for you, and we'll continue to. And I mean, it was a moment right there and she dismissed herself, and we thanked her for the cupcakes, and she, she headed out. And when the door shut, I said, Sadie, what, what's the story? She said, well, a couple weeks ago, uh, there were a bunch of ambulances and police cars that came down our street. And a bunch of us neighbors, we all kind of came out in our front yard, but it was too far down to know which house it was. It was about 10 or 12 houses down. But the ambulances stayed there, and, and one ambulance stayed there for a really long time. And she said, we could hear a woman crying, and we could hear her just wailing. So she, she said, I waited a few days, and then I walked down there, and I didn't know which house it was, but she said, I just thought, it's got to be right around one of these two or three homes. And she said, I went up to one of the houses, and the first house that I knocked on, that woman came to the door. And she said, I just said, hey, I, I know that there were some ambulances and police cars down here a, uh, a few days ago. And she said, I just am curious to see if there's anything I can do to help you out or what it is that was, was going on down here. And the woman just broke down. She said, my husband was working outside. He had a heart attack. He passed away. He was 52 years old. I said, Beth, Sadie just talked to her. And Sadie ministered to her, and she's been able to check on her a couple of times, and that was the story behind the hug and the tears. Sadie is for her neighbors. Am I for mine? Are you for yours? Are you for the valley? Or is that just a catchy phrase to put on a T-shirt? Maybe you heard about the couple who went shopping with their five-year-old son, and through the course of time, they got a little bit more interested in the clothing than they did keeping an eye on their son. And after a few minutes, one thought that he was with the other, and the other thought that he was with the other, and 
Finally, they realized that neither one of them had their son. And so they started looking and searching, and then after another five minutes, they got the store clerks and employees involved, and people were looking everywhere, and it kind of became one of those things where everyone is involved in the search. And finally, it hit the point where it was about 10 or 15 minutes had passed, and something just sunk within the pit of the mom, and she thought, I might never see my son again. And in her heart of hearts, she thought, he, he's been abducted, I'm never gonna see him. But, but then, over the loudspeaker, she heard a voice say, would Mr. and Mrs. Bernard Johnson please report to the manager's office on the second level? And they went bounding up the escalator steps, and they found the manager's office, and they threw open the door, and there, seated back behind the manager's desk, was their five-year-old son with his feet propped up, sipping on a cold Coke, having the time of his life. But when the little boy saw the frantic and worried expression on his parents' faces, his smile immediately gave way and he burst into tears. Do you realize why? He had no idea he was lost until he was found. And each and every day, you rub shoulders with people who are in precisely the same spiritual condition and they do not have a clue that they're lost. And they have no idea that they're heading into a crisis eternity. But maybe you, having that encounter with Christ and having that relationship with Christ, maybe you could lead them to a place where they have never been. Maybe you could help those who are lost to be found, just like that guy did in Mayfield, Kentucky. Maybe that's the calling that God has upon your life. And it starts with just a simple invitation this Christmas. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but will have eternal life. That's the entire gospel in one sentence and that word perish, when you see that word perish right there, it actually comes from, in the original language, it means lost. And so God came from heaven to earth in order to solve the potentially devastating problem of being lost. Jesus Christ is for the world. Jesus Christ is for the valley. And you probably know the third reminder. Jesus Christ is for you. And you may have heard that before, but maybe you you don't believe it and you need to be reminded of the implications. The orchestration of a baby being born of a virgin in Bethlehem was basically a rescue mission that God engineered and did all on his own for you. And he would have done it if you were the only person on the face of the earth. That's how much he loves you. That's what Christmas is all about. He is a powerful God, but he is a personal God. Romans chapter five, verse eight says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus was born in a stable, but he was destined for a cross. And that's a message that the world needs to hear. And they need to hear it from Christians who live lives of love. The message is you are loved by God. You see, the world doesn't need to be told it's going to hell. The world needs to be shown how to get to heaven. And that's where you come in. Through your words, through your life, through your invitations. You don't drive people to Jesus. You lovingly lead people to Jesus. And you just faithfully scatter seed and you plant seeds wherever you can. But I promise you this, you will never reap a harvest if you never plant a seed. It's impossible. The pandemic got us out of the habit of interacting with others and over time we've gradually chosen isolation over conversation and we need to return to engaging with others and asking questions of people and spurring spiritual conversations. Simple questions like, what do you think happens when a person passes away? Do you believe in a heaven or a hell? Do you believe that there is a a higher power? Just ask questions like that and then just listen because there are some people who desperately need the hope that only Christ can give and maybe you can help to bring them that hope. And this week you may be saying to someone, you may have given up on God, but God hasn't given up on you. And they need to hear that from you. And if you are here today because of the invitation of a friend of yours, then you should feel very loved and valued. 
If you're at one of our campuses, just know this, that person who invited you, they care. This is their way of communicating that the faith they found in Jesus Christ has changed them and, and they want you to know the good news of, of what it is that they have found. Let me tell you about a, a gal named Francine. We first met when she moved to Louisville, Kentucky. She was an energetic New Yorker who spoke her mind. She was hired to be the morning show host of the radio show on the uh, 50,000 watt station that goes all across the state of Kentucky. And we first met when I was a guest on her show one day. And after that, we stayed in touch. But in the months to come, on the air, she ridiculed and openly mocked some of my traditional values and Christian habits. But Beth and I would try to still encourage her when we would see her out at at some uh, community event. And one time she was... Uh, working on planning uh, a big event for the community, and, and she asked if I would speak for it, which uh, told me that, you know, she didn't have a budget to work with, and she probably wanted me to do something. So I said, yeah, I, I'd be glad to. And then after I spoke, before Beth and I left that day, I invited Francine to come to our Christmas Eve service, and she came. And I'll never forget, as I was preaching, just seeing her down on on the front row, seated with my family there, and I just wondered what was going through her mind. And after I preached, I walked down, and everyone in the congregation, it was Christmas Eve, so we, we, we lighted candles, everybody had a candle, and then we sang Silent Night. And during Silent Night, I, I glanced over at Francine, and I saw a tear running down her cheek. She started coming to church with us occasionally. She and my peaceful wife, Beth, are about as opposite as day and night. And never before had Beth had a woman who would disagree so strongly with her and seemed to just enjoy disagreeing with her on things. And yet she always wanted Beth's counsel. And sometimes Francine would end up after a worship service crying in the bathroom and saying to my wife, I want what you have. And then there was one sermon in particular that got her to thinking and praying and it kind of opened the door to some deep spiritual conversations. And two weeks after that, Francine said she wanted to make a commitment to Christ and she wanted to be baptized. And she requested that that Beth be the one to immerse her. And she did. And Francine began to speak openly on her radio show about her faith and her transformation. And I don't know how many times Beth would say to me, she and I are so different, I don't know why God brought Francine into my life. But then we found out why. And one night we got a call from a hospital that said that Francine had suffered a brain aneurysm. Can you get to the hospital? And we spent the last few hours with her. She was 43 years old. This was just months after her baptism. Because she had such a large following, they they live streamed her, her funeral in its entirety on the NBC affiliate in Louisville, but they live streamed it on the radio station that went all across the state. And so everyone had to hear the gospel from me whether they wanted to or not. And I shared Francine's testimony, and people were moved to make commitments to Christ as a result of the service. One truck driver called up our church while the service was still going on. He said, I've been driving on the interstate. I've been listening for about an hour. I've made a decision to follow God. He said, I just thought I should tell somebody. So we told our receptionist. On Francine's radio broadcast, she concluded every radio broadcast she ever did with the same last line, and I chose to conclude her funeral message with the same last line. Life is short, so make the most of it. Listen to me, you will never know how many people could be affected and transformed by the Lord just because of your simple invitation to a Christmas service. You have no idea how a family tree could be forever changed by your simple, genuine request. People are open to checking out churches at this time of year. 
Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Jesus is for you. Are you for him? And here's my challenge for you. My challenge is is very simple. I just want you to invite at least two people to attend one of the Christmas services with you. Now, I know that some of you will invite 20 people. Some of you may have already invited several different families. I understand that. But for some of you, it will be a stretch even just to invite two people. But that communicates to them that, that you value them. So scatter that seed indiscriminately and let them know that you care about them. Let them know that you're praying for them, that, that you're there for them. And be ready to willingly Uh, spontaneously invite people, acquaintances or whoever it might be. Now, invariably, the more people you invite, there'll be somebody that comes up to you and says, well, you know what? If If I ever walked inside of a church, the roof would cave in. You just look at them and say, that's why we're meeting outside. We thought you might come, okay? But you make that invitation Because everybody needs to know that God is for them, not against them. May this be our motto. I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. And that anybody could be you. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, in just a minute, we're gonna gonna sing a song together. We're gonna worship. We're gonna sing a prayer together. And it's a prayer on behalf of the people that we've been thinking about as this sermon has gone on. It's people that we, that we care about. It's people that their picture has been in our mind. Their name has been imprinted as, as I've talked. We just know who it is that we need to invite. So Lord, may we, may we sing this prayer on their behalf and pray that they will experience it and pray that they will know that there is a God who is for them. Lord, help us to take advantage of these opportunities at Christmas, the season of your birth. It's in the powerful name of Jesus Christ that we pray and all God's people said.
him away there is no thing that you've done that would keep his love away from you he loves you perfectly because you're his he sent his son Jesus to this earth to demonstrate that great love for us the maker of the universe sees you and he loves you and he is for you that's something to celebrate, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And we're gonna get to do that in the week to come as we celebrate the coming of Jesus, the Messiah to this earth. We celebrate Christmas. We want you to walk out of these doors as people who know the truth of who God is in our hearts, that he sees you and he's for you. And let's share that love with those around us. Take one of the invite cards. Don't come back next week alone. Have a great rest of your week. We'll see you back next weekend.